I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Good morning. Today we celebrate the Feast of St. Michael and all angels, one of the patronal, one of the central feasts of Grace Cathedral. It is not a central feast for the whole Episcopal Church. It is uh, on the calendar, but no one makes as much of it, I think, as we do. And uh, there's, there's a historical reason for that, which is not important today, or maybe not important at all. Uh, but the point of today is about the ministry of angels, and uh, specifically, a clear signal between humanity and the earth and God and a clear signal between God, humanity, and the earth. And what keeps that from being true? The prevention of the clear signal. So that's what we'll explore today. Uh, the, the first lesson from the Hebrew Scriptures, which Ellen read so beautifully, and the Gospel, which was proclaimed, are both about the clear signal. Uh, there is a um, camp, an Episcopal Church and Camp uh, Center in Texas, outside of Houston, called Camp Allen. And the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church habitually meets there every other year when we're not in the times we're in. And they uh, are not kind to certain carriers uh, telephone carriers, uh, and uh, so I won't name which ones work there and which ones don't because this is not a commercial, um, but let me say there are many bishops who are walking to the one spot <laughs> on the campus that it works, and they're holding their phones up and trying to get these urgent messages back from their diocese or to their diocese. Uh, and it's quite hysterical if you back off and watch of it and if you're not the person wanting to get an urgent message in or out. Now Jacob uh, is not, it, it's an interesting technology to put a stone under your head and go to sleep and get a clear signal to God. Uh, but what, what we have learned with technology is anything that works. Uh, and so this is what uh, Jacob is doing. And in fact, uh, incubating dreams in various ancient traditions use the idea of an uncomfortable place to sleep in order to wake you up periodically through the night so that you remember your dreams. You know that when you wake up, that's the dream you remember often. And so in England, for instance, at sacred wells, People sleep on stone in order to interrupt their sleep so they remember the dreams that the gods or God gives them. So this is what Jacob is doing. He's trying to get a clear signal, and it works. He sees this remarkable vision, a dream vision of a ladder between the earth and heaven. And on that ladder, ladder he sees angels ascending and descending. That is, since angel means messenger, they are carrying his hopes and prayers to God. And God is answering clearly and beautifully to Jacob. The message is unimpeded, and it flows from earth to heaven, from Jacob to heaven, and from God to Jacob, God to humanity, God to the earth. And this is reprised by Jesus in the gospel lesson. And there uh, we hear, hear Jesus saying that on the Son of Man, that is a way to say on the child of humanity himself, who is a representative of all of us, that th this is the ladder now. And the angels are ascending and descending on, on Jesus. So he's taking this ancient story of Jacob and moving it in and helping us understand his own role as the one who gives us a clear channel 
a clear message, a clear signal between us and that us includes all of life and God and between God and all of us, all our relations. But why doesn't that work all the time? What is the impediment that prevents us from knowing the message of God to us and feeling that our prayers do not rise to God? Can I, can I say rise to God? Go to God. And that, that is the story that Art read to us from the book of Revelation, the incredible book of the apocalypse. Uh, unlike Grace Cathedral's love of St. Michael and all angels, the Episcopal Church has a very cautious relationship with the book of Revelation. <laughs> we don't read it very often <laughs> in, uh, in church, and, um, and I would dare say in your private devotions that it's probably not your go-to uh, book of the Bible. It's an extraordinary book, however. It's an extraordinary book, and to move into it, let me say that it is um, like Calypso music. Well, no, really. <laughs> uh, the word apocalypse means to unveil, and Calypso thus means to veil. And Calypso music, the Caribbean music of Calypso, is veiled music. Why? Well, because there were slave owners and there were slaves. And these are political messages veiled in fun, danceable music. But the apocalypse is the unveiling, showing us what the truth is. And in the same way that Calypso music was deeply political in that people's lives depended on not being exposed, to the slave owners, so was the book of the Revelation, the book of the Apocalypse, needing to be veiled from whom? From the Roman Empire. This great power that was inimical to the way, the young Christian movement of, that, that we call Christianity now, it was veiled for their protection for the protection of those who wrote the letter and the protection of those who read the later letter, the protection of those who followed the resurrected Jesus. And so it's important to know that this is the setting. And this is, uh, this is what this book, in a way, is all about, is the vindication of those who follow God in the ways of justice and peace and truth. But more to the point, there's a dragon, and that dragon is identified as that ancient serpent, that primordial serpent, that original serpent, that is the one in the garden. So it's both a dragon and that first deceiver of humanity, the one who leads the whole ecumenis, the ecumene, the whole world astray. So there's some things about dragons <laughs> that we need to uh, kind of hold together and grasp. Uh, dragons, Joseph Campbell said in that wonderful series where he was interviewed by Bill Moyers, uh, there are two kinds of dragons. There's the dragons of the East and the dragons of the West. And we'll leave aside the dragons of the East uh, like the history of why we like St. Michael and all angels here, it's not important today. But the dragons of the West, Campbell said, represent human greed, selfishness. Why? Because, as he said, they hoard things they cannot use. They hoard virgins and treasure. Think of Smaug in The Hobbit and his great self, as drawn by Tolkien, actually, circled around a glittering pile of treasure. 
You can see chalices and goblets and plate and jewels and, and money, gold and silver and bronze, all glittering, enfolded by Smaug's great body with a little steam coming out of his nostrils and one eye cocked to make sure that he sees anyone coming in to get his treasure, which he cannot spend, which he has no use for except that he wants it. Now, what Campbell does not say in his wonderful exposition of this is, what is that treasure? What is it that the dragon is hoarding and holding away? What is so precious? Well, the text from the book of Revelation today says that this dragon is Diablos, the devil, and Satan, and that he accuses the believers day and night before God. There's a problem with that idea. Would God be taken in by this dragon? Would God be fooled about you, about me, about the earth, by this dragon? No. What is being said here is that it's we who are fooled by the dragon. The dragon is giving you and me, our consciousness, a message of our unworthiness to hear God's message to us and to speak to God all the concerns of our hearts to God, that this is not something we should do or could do because of our unworthiness, whatever we think that is. So this is a veiling of our own hearts, my siblings. And it is that which is being removed, not the veil on God's face, but the veil on our consciousness that keeps us from seeing the treasure. And that treasure is, in fact, the essential and eternal message of God, which is meant to be clearly given and clearly received by humanity and by all the earth and by you and by me. It is the message that Jesus received so clearly when he understood that God was his, his parent, his beloved parent, Papa, Mama. When he understood that, when he says in the gospel, the Father and I are one, that is a message of, of a clear message being received and given by Jesus. He is at one with God. There is no distance between him and God. And so he becomes that conduit, that ladder, upon which the angels ascend and descend for you and for me and for the earth. And what was his message? After his baptism, he's driven into the wilderness and in the wilderness, he's tempted by the same dragon. And then he begins his ministry, impelled by the Holy Spirit that visited him in his baptism, impelled by the same spirit that drove him into the wilderness, impelled by that spirit into the Galilee, where he went around having one message. The kingdom of heaven has come near you and is among you. And that is, of course, as you know, I say over and over, the beloved community. And here is the message at the center of that, which is God loves you. Just that. That is the clear message signal that is coursing down through Jesus to you, to me, and to all the earth that is impeded by our own sense of unworthiness that Jesus came to take away. The book of the apocalypse does not take place at the end of time. It sounds like that in the story, but it is out of time. It is all times. 
This message has been given to you in Christ Jesus. It is eternal. It is immutable. It cannot be taken away from you. It is as clear as the light of day. God is overflowing love, and that love is meant for you.